Good morning, Rutherford County. My name is Charles Davies. My wife, Connie Davies, we're with the Word of Faith Fellowship. And we want to come to you today and we want to share with you what God's put on our heart and something that we've learned in our life that has really been beneficial to us and really has opened our eyes to the whole purpose of, of why we're here on this earth. Because you know, when you're born again, that's just the beginning is what we found of a new life. And that is the most cru crucial concept that we can partake of because when you're born again, you, as it says in First uh, Peter 2.2, 2, it says, like newborn babies, you should crave, thirst for, earnestly desire the pure, unadulterated spiritual milk, like newborn babies. We are a newborn baby when we're born again. That means that we have to grow, we have to learn, we have a whole new life in front of us. And that life is a good life. It's the best life Connie and I have ever had as we continually grow with Jesus. And that is a process that takes place. And again, I want to share with you that being born again is not, not the end. I thought, well, I, I got my ticket to heaven. I'll go to church. I'll pay my tithes. I'll do all the, you know, the right things. And that's all there is. And then when you read the scriptures, you find out that salvation is not just being born again. Salvation is a process that takes place in our life as we continue to go to God and allow him to teach us, instruct us, and, and actually we become disciples. The Bible says, and Jesus said this in Matthew 28, that we are to be his disciple. And he commanded the, uh, the 12 apostles, the 11. He says, go in and make disciples, teaching them to do everything. Mm -hmm. And when you see yourself as a disciple, you have a whole new meaning and purpose in life. That you, you're not just to go through your days and do what you know you need to do, but you're to get up every morning and say, okay, Jesus, what's your will today? I'm here for you. My purpose is to serve you, to live for you. And there's a book written in heaven of every day of my life. And I need to know what's in that book and I need to know how to do it. And just like a, a baby, you know, teach me how to speak. So I speak by the Spirit of God. You know, in Romans 8, it says that the true sons of God are led by the Spirit of God. We want to be led by God's Spirit. That's where joy is. That's where peace is. That's where love is. That's where the fruit of the Spirit is that we find in Galatians 6. And that fruit comes as we're being led by God's Spirit. But we can't be led by God's Spirit unless we learn how to be led by God's Spirit. Unless we let people in our lives to teach us and we, we get in this Word and let the Word of God show us. So again, I want to go back to 1 Peter 2. And as I shared in verse 2, that like newborn babies, the Bible says, were to crave and thirst spiritual milk. Spiritual milk means that God wants to bring spiritually a development in our life. Because when we're born again, we become a new creature in Christ. The old's passed away, the Bible says, and everything's become new. And that new person on the inside of you and I, when we're truly born again, needs to be developed. And the way that we develop it and the way it grows is by having spiritual milk. Just like our body needs food, our spirit man needs food. And that food comes from the lips of Jesus Christ. And it goes on, it says, Since you have already tasted the goodness and kindness of the Lord, and when you're truly born again, you've experienced the love of God in your heart. And you have a love for other people. It says, come to him, 
to that living stone. Once we're born again, we're to come to him, a living stone, who men tried, threw away, but which is chosen and precious in God's sight. Come and like living stones, be yourselves built up in a spiritual house. The whole purpose of being born again is that we can grow together and become, come into a spiritual house where we're spiritually united with one another in love, in peace, in patience, and we have the grace to live that way all our, all days of our life. And that is a development, and that's a growing. Have we arrived? No, none of us have arrived. But on the other hand, God has given us the ability when you're born again to be able to enjoy God in every area of our life, to enjoy the presence of God, to enjoy the peace and the love of God in every area of our life. And not be like we were in the past and make excuses why we still are that way. Because I was guilty of that. I was making excuses why I was the way I was. But now I see as a born again Christian, God's made a way. And that way is to go to him and let him teach me and help me. Because I need him. Not just to be born again. I need him to do everything that I do so I can experience God in everything and be as as we're going to see mature Christians in the Lord and I want to go to 2 Timothy 3 16 it says every scripture is God breathed given by his inspiration and profitable for instruction for reproof and conviction of sin, for correction of error and discipline and obedience, for training in righteousness and in holy living and in conformity to God's will. And that word conformity to God's will. We are being conformed to God's will. That's a real key. We need to be that way. Conformity to God's will in thought, in purpose, and in action. It's a lifestyle. You know, the Bible, God says that we are to imitate God. I believe that's in Ephesians, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Ephesians. Ephesians, we're to imitate God. You say, well, I can't imitate God. I mean, God's God and I'm just a human being. Well, that's true. You were just a human being, but when you became born again, the Spirit of God came into you. And now you and I, just like we read, like a baby, we can learn to grow, we can learn to walk, we can learn to talk, and we can learn to live by God's Spirit. And the more we live by God's Spirit, I, I can tell you, Connie and I, the more we live by God's Spirit, the more peace we have, the more joy we have, and every day we enjoy life because we're learning to live by God's Spirit. And when we miss it, we repent, but we just don't stay there. We just get back up and say, God, show us, teach us. Because you see, it's an effort to grow with God. It just doesn't happen. You know, a, 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 a baby when he's born, yes, he didn't have anything to do with it. But afterward, there's an effort to learn to walk. There's an effort to learn to talk. There's an effort. And there's an effort for you and I to grow with Jesus. First, we need to know that God commands us and wants us to. And second, we need to go to him and ask his help so it, that work can be done in our heart. Because unless you and I ask Jesus to help us, then his hands are tied. That's why it says in the scriptures, we're to ask and keep on asking, seek and keep on seeking, knock and keep on knocking. Because God does want to be Lord of our life. He wants to help us. He's there to help us. And the more Connie and I found out, the more we cry out to him and seek him, the more God helps us. And the more we change and the more we grow. And those childish ways that we've learned, we've put them aside. And we've learned a new way to live. We've learned a new way to talk. 
We learned a new way to think because our thinking was wrong when we came to Jesus. I have one more scripture. It's in Colossians 1, 28. It says, Him, meaning Jesus Christ, we preach and proclaim, warning and admonishing everyone, instructing everyone in all wisdom, comprehensive insight, purposes of God, that we may present every person, talking about born again person, mature, full grown, fully initiated, complete and perfect in Christ Jesus. We have a goal to reach and it is a process. And salvation, when you study the scriptures on salvation, I challenge you to do that. When you do that, you're going to see that salvation is not a one-time thing. Salvation is a process in our life as we continually to surrender our will to God. Surrendering to God is not a one-time thing. Surrendering to God is every day and learning to do it every moment of every day because God has the answers. And you may be facing things in your life and you may think there's no way out. But I'm here to tell you, if you cry out to God... Mm -hmm. God will make a way out. I know, honey, you have some things to share. Yes. Uh, Charles just read um, in the book of Colossians. Um, and, you know, the Apostle Paul was the one that wrote that book. But if you look at all the books that Paul wrote to the church, there were 13 epistles, I believe, that he wrote. You see that same vein where he's constantly correcting. He's constantly coming to the church and teaching them God's ways how they're to live, how they're to speak, how the, their relationships with other people. He's constantly teaching the church. And we have a lot to learn from the Apostle Paul. But my favorite epistle that he wrote was actually Philippians. And the part of the reason why is because there is such an emphasis on this progressive development, uh, this growing and this changing and maturity that needs to be taking place in a Christian's life. So we're going to spend a few minutes in the book of Philippians, and we're going to start in Philippians 1, verse 6. And in this scripture, Paul says to the church in Philippi, I am convinced and sure of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will continue it until the day of Jesus Christ, right up to the time of his return. And look at these words. Developing the good work, perfecting and bringing it to full completion in you. Again, reiterating the, the things that Charles was saying, you know, when we come to Jesus and we're born again, that's just the beginning of a relationship with God. That's just the beginning of a new life. And Paul is encouraging the church, even as he's correcting them, he's telling them, I'm convinced I know that as long as you're submitted to God, that God is going to continue to work in your life, to develop you, to mature you. And, you know, all we need to do is really submit to God and hear what he has to say through the word of God or through the ministers of God. Whenever God comes to us, we're to have that that attitude of submission and humility as a true disciple to let Jesus show us what areas in our life need to change. If you go on down Philippians 1, and I'm just going to skip around a little bit, um, We're going to go through some of the key verses that make this point. But in 1.9 in Philippians, it says, And this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more. Listen to this progressive uh, idea that, that he's given to the church, that we can grow in our love walk more and more and extend to its fullest development in knowledge and all keen insight, and that your love may display itself in a greater depth of acquaintance and more comprehensive discernment. And that we may surely learn to sense what is vital and approve and prize what is excellent and of real value. And, you know, as you grow in God, you begin your priorities change. You begin to to value things that God values because your heart begins to to change. Your, Your thinking begins to change. And that is what God wants. He wants us to grow into a place of maturity in in the spirit where we see what is really important about our lives. And what is the most important thing is serving God, is knowing God, uh, growing in God. Why is that? To prepare us for one day going to heaven. And that's what God is doing in our lives. We're going to skip over to Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. And it says, Therefore, my dear ones, As you have always obeyed my suggestions, again, he's coming and bringing correction and suggestions, 
So now, not only with the enthusiasm you would show in my presence, but much more because I'm absent. Work out, carry, cultivate, carry to the goal, and fully complete your own salvation. With reverence and awe and trembling, with self-distrust, because we can't change ourselves. All God requires of us is submission to God. Then He's the one that changes us. But self-distrust with serious caution, tenderness of conscience, watchfulness against temptation, and timidly shrinking from whatever might offend God and discredit the name of Christ. You know, we do not want to be reckless with our life. When we come to Jesus, we want to know that, you know, our walk with God is a serious matter. I mean, this is life and death. This is eternity that we're talking about. Yes, we have a life to live here on this earth, and we want to live it to its fullest. But our goal really is going to heaven. And if we're not walking with God here, if we're not looking for God to help us here, where are we headed? What's, what's going to happen to us? It says, not in your own strength, for it is God. God is the one who is all the while effectually at work in you, energizing and creating in you, the power and the desire. You know, we found out that there's some people that don't want to change. And they come to they come to Jesus, right. maybe they get born again, but then all of a sudden they hit up with attitudes like, Well, I like my life. I like the way I live. I like doing this. Well, if you're a true disciple of Jesus, you're gonna let him teach you. And you're gonna let him show you the areas in your life that are not right. And you're gonna be willing to help let him help you change in those areas, but give you the power and the desire both to will and to work for his good pleasure, satisfaction, and his delight. That's right. And that, that is the heart God wants for us. Yeah, just real quickly on that. I noticed in my own life, that was a place where I had to be honest with myself, just like what Connie was saying, and acknowledge, you know, this. there's an area in my life where, you know, I, I don't want to change. But when I went to God and said, God, that you know, this I don't want to change in this area. That's when the presence of God and the grace of God was there to change me. I was honest with him. I was mm -hmm. sincere. Uh, I wasn't doing it out of a stubbornness or an unwillingness in my heart. It was out of a place in my heart of, you know, I, I, I acknowledge that there, I don't want to, but I, I do want you to change me. That's the difference of someone that is putting forth an effort to want to change and someone just throws up their hands and says, like I did in the past, you know, this is the way I am. And, you know, these scriptures are such an encouragement to us and they teach us, but think about who wrote this letter. It was Paul. So if you go to Ephesians, excuse me, Philippians 3, listen to what Paul says. Paul even acknowledges the Apostle Paul, who wrote 13 epistles in the New Testament, and we read about his life, his conversion in the book of Acts, we see how Paul sees him even himself. Yes, he's correcting the church. Yes, he's teaching the church. He's helping the church. But he's saying, listen, I've not arrived yet either. Look what it says in Philippians chapter 3. verse. I'm going to start in 10. Read all of it. It's very good. But in verse 10, it starts... For my determined purpose is that I may know him. Now listen to his attitude. That I may progressively become more deeply and intimately acquainted with him, perceiving and recognizing and understanding the wonders of his person more strongly and more clearly. You see this grow, growing pattern that he's, he's desiring. And that I may in that same way come to know the power outflowing from his resurrection which it exerts over believers. Now think about that. The resurrected life of, of God, when we're born again, comes into us. It is a life that changes, that transforms us, that it exerts over believers, and that I may so share his sufferings as to be continually transformed in spirit into his likeness, again, becoming imitators of God, even to his death in the hope that if possible, I may attain to the spiritual and moral resurrection that lifts me out from among the dead, even while in the body. So that tells us there's a way to live. There's a resurrected right. life that we can experience even while in the body. People think about resurrection coming once our body, once we die. No, resurrected life begins the moment you let Jesus come into your heart. Right. Eternal life begins then. 
And that, that transformation that needs to take place begins then as well. Not that I, listen, this is Paul again, remember, not that I have now attained this ideal or have already been made perfect, but I press on to lay hold of, grasp, and make my own that for which Christ Jesus the Messiah has laid hold of me and made me his own. What did Jesus lay hold of our lives for? So that we could be born again, have a relationship with him, and grow in God. Right. And it says, I do not consider, brethren, that I have captured and made it my own yet. But one thing I do, it is my one aspiration. And check this out to see if this is your aspiration, if this is your goal. Forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. You know, many times it's our past that hinders us. Mm -hmm. And we go back and that maybe is where we make our excuses or maybe... You know, there were things that happened in our life that we seem to not be able to get away from, but we can't get away from it because right. God has called us to a new life. It says, I'm forgetting what lies behind and straining forward. That's that effort that Charles was talking about a little bit ago. You know, a changed life doesn't just happen automatic. You have to have a desire. Right. Much like an athlete has to train to run a race. There, there's an effort that's, that's needed uh, in order for that change to take place. Uh, it's a place of submission in your heart and doing what God requires you to do to change. It says, I press on toward the goal to win the supreme and heavenly prize to which God in Christ Jesus is calling us upward. Now, a lot of times when people read this passage of Philippians, and I was guilty of this uh, at one time, they don't, go, they don't go on and read verse 15. To me, this is a real key. It says, so let those of us who are spiritually mature and full grown have this mind and hold these convictions it almost sounds like he's contradicting himself like he's saying well i've not made it but now i'm saying i'm spiritually mature and full grown it's not a contradiction what he's talking about is the attitude that we should have we should be able to acknowledge you know i have not made it i'm not perfected there's still things in my life that need to change but I'm not stopping here. I'm going to press on toward that goal and I'm going to keep going to God and I'm going to keep allowing him to change my life until I reach that goal. And of course, our ultimate goal is to go to heaven. But Paul is saying here that he is spiritually mature because he has that attitude that I'm going to press on. I'm going to keep going to God. I'm going to believe him that I'm going to keep changing the way I talk, the way I act, the things I do. I'm going to let him change me. And if any, if in any respect... You have a different attitude of mind. God will make that clear to you also. So if we don't have this attitude, God wants to change that right now. He wants us to change the way we think, change the way we see our walk with God, and realize, you know, we're not perfected. That's okay. God is there to help us. God is there to bring us into that place of relationship with Him that we grow in Him and in His grace. Another place that I wanted to share, though, very quickly is in the book of Ephesians. And again, Ephesians was written by Paul. Again, more correction coming to the church. And I think this is a very important scripture here because it not only speaks of our need to go before God in prayer and in the Word of God, but it also talks about our need for God's people. You know, we are not an island unto ourselves. We need each other. We need each other's gifts to help us grow in God. And this is really what brought Charles and I here to Rutherford County because we were seeking God with all of our hearts and we knew there were things that were not right in our lives even though we were trying with all of our heart to serve Him. We knew there were things that were not right and we looked to see where can, where can we go to get help, the help that we need and we were living in Winston-Salem. And as we cried out to God, God led us here to Sam and Jane Whaley. And what we found here is that God has gifts in the church, gifts that he has given to his people, some to be apostles. This is in Ephesians 4.11, some to be prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, and some teachers. And what is the purpose for the body of Christ and those ministers in our lives? The, it says in verse 12 of Ephesians 4, his intention was the perfecting and the full equipping of the saints, his consecrated people, that they should do the work of ministering toward building up Christ's body, the church, and that it may develop until we all attain 
oneness in the faith in the comprehension of the full and accurate knowledge of the Son of God, and that we may arrive at really mature manhood, the completeness of personality, which is nothing less than the standard height of Christ's own perfection, the, the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, and the completeness found in Him. So as we cry out to God ourselves personally, and we read the Word of God and, and we pray, God also has people in our lives to help us mature and grow in Him. The ministry gifts are so important. And you may be like us. You may be a person that understands and knows that wait, I'm supposed to be living a different life and I don't know what's going on or you know, why I'm not changing. If you cry out to God, He will lead you to those uh, that He has ordained to be in your life to help you to grow. I know right. Charles and I all the time are helping each other, uh, exhorting each other and helping each other see uh, where we need to change. And we talked about it even a little bit ago that, you know, sh uh, iron sharpeneth iron and, and we need each other's gifts. We're in each other's lives to help each other grow in God. And if you're stagnant, and if you're not growing, then you need to ask Jesus why. Because you should be, if you're born again, your life should be changing. That's right. And, you know, I think of a scripture uh, it says in Matthew, it says, um, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Then all these things will be taken care of. And you know, and I can look back in my life and I can see how I, the devil had me caught up in the cares of this world. And, you know, I got to do this and I got to do that. And you don't understand. I got this, I got that. And you know, there's always an excuse. But when we made a decision to seek God first, out of that place, God did start changing us. He started, and then things began, began to work out in our life. And I can tell you, because of what we've experienced and, and testimonies of others, that it pays to seek God first in your life, to make Him one. And God knows our hearts. We can, you know... I, I was a big deceiver. I, there were times in my life when it looked like I was serving God, but in my heart, I had other things in my life. God knows. But when someone is seeking God, and I mean consistently, you know, the Bible says we're to ask and keep on asking, seek and keep on seeking. It talks about the, the woman going to the judge, the unjust judge, and being persistent. And that persistence of faith, God says... He will answer because he's a loving God. He won't give us a stone. He won't give us a serpent. And if you're wondering why things aren't working out in your life, I can tell you, you cry out to God. You may not understand. We, we didn't understand. We see clearly looking back, but mm -hmm. we didn't understand right. at that point what was going on and why, we weren't, why things weren't working out. We knew some things. We didn't know how to change those areas because sometimes when you look at it on the surface level, you never get to the root of it. But when you cry out to God, God says, well, you know why? For example, for me, you know why you, you had anger in your life? Because there was so much hurt in your life. Because I was crying out. I knew it wasn't right to be angry. There was so much hurt. And now that hurt in my heart, you know, it produced an anger. And so when God dealt with the hurt, it helped set me free from the anger. Now, this was like 30-some years ago. So God has the keys for your life and my life. And God alone. And you and I will never be satisfied until we cry out to Him and seek Him with all our heart. And we, just like Connie said, we surrender our being to Him every day so that He can tell us what to do. And he can deal with us as a father does a son and train us. That's right. Because until you're trained, until you're discipled, you'll never experience That's the right. love of God in your life. Well, I see that our times run out. We want you to know that we love you. We want you to know that we're praying for you, that we care, that the work that God's done in our heart we're so grateful for, but 
It's not enough to be grateful for it. We want others to experience the same right. love and the same change that we've experienced. And we, I want you also to know that uh, our programs are Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 8.30 to, to 9. And you can go to our website, wordoffaithfellowship.org, and you can see all the radio programs. God bless, and again, we love you. Have a great day.